Success. Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 94 of Libraries in Response. Uh, it's the kickoff of our year five, which is kind of mind boggling to me, but you know, here we are. Uh, we started, as many of you know, in response to the pandemic uh, of March in 2020, just, okay, what is this all about? And you know, what are what are libraries doing about it? They're, you know, the building is closed, how do we respond? And that just kept, kept rolling. And uh, then there were more things coming up to deal with, like the, the, the social crisis triggered by the Floyd murder, and then the economic crisis and, and the political crisis and the ever-present climate crisis, which uh, gets worse. And so the idea of libraries responding to all these crises at every level, as uh, Deb Fallows put it in an article on libraries as second responders, libraries deal with crises at every level, from personal to regional to global. And uh, that really resonated with us and does. And, and so that's how we proceeded is looking at those various kind of challenges that libraries have faced and how they've been dealing with them. And it's been just really fascinating. And uh, of course, these are all recorded and it's constituted a, a record, uh, kind of a historical record of what has happened, you know, kind of along the way. And we're looking at, at kind of strategies to how to how to use that other than just a list of recordings, which are, are becoming actually more popular as time goes along. But how to how to mine all that for you know to pull something insightful maybe from all the discussions we've had the ninety three hours plus of discussions and explorations around different topics. We are of course the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open collaboration of of libraries doing interesting things with technology from communications to, to AI, to really just any kind of emerging technology that, that uh, is sort of disruptive to the world, the library world and world in general. Our uh, partner in production here is uh, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, the IFLA based in The Hague and at the helm usually though he's busy doing something right now, is Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA, a long time partner with us as we have joined with IFLA and others like the Internet Society and, and uh, A for AI and a number of other international organizations to address the global digital divide. It's, it's our notion or our advocacy that every community, at least every community have a, have, has a connection that is connected and that, of course, the library is the sort of the preferred uh, community hub to provide such a resource, which is not what everybody wants, but it's something everybody needs, in our opinion, that there should be some kind of a resource like that within ready access of everyone. And so that's the kind of a campaign that's going on. And it's not just for inclusion in the normal way we think about it, so like access courses and telehealth and so forth, but... It's also there as a uh, as a resource in times of, of crisis or general disaster when everything is out, the electricity is out, the internet is out. It doesn't matter where you live. You may think you're connected, but suddenly the power goes out. You're no longer connected. I mean, your phone maybe is connected, but it's the cell system is probably overwhelmed and the battery will die. So at some point you have to leave unless you have a radio, you're not connected anymore. You don't know what's going on. You know, your neighbors don't know either. So you have to go somewhere. And the library is a logical place to go, both to find out what's happening and to get access. And, and presumably, if the if the facility has backup power, which every facility should, uh, it, it's connected. And so that's a super important resource. Of course, on a day-to-day -day basis, no one really thinks about it. It's like why we don't do all the things we should do to prepare for for crises, personal home crises, but we should, we just don't. As, as there's a curve of investment in this, in crisis response, it's like 
yes, you're right, but I just can't get to it today. I, you know, we will, but today I've got other fish to fry, urgent things I have to do today. And then it actually happens because it always does at one point or another. And then blank checks come out. And whatever it costs, I don't care. We need help today. And then the, it passes and then that trails off that investment, you know, either quickly or slowly, depending on what kind of lessons are learned about next time. So it's an interesting kind of psychosocial phenomenon, I suppose you would call it. Our sponsor, our special sponsor this uh, season is IMLS. We really appreciate them stepping in finally to support this uh, series. Uh, and these are our other sponsors. The Internet Society has been there for us. The Library of Michigan, the State of New Jersey Library, Texas Library have come in as well. It's just great. We love state libraries. State library agencies is their technically term. And then our, we have media sponsorship from Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast. We thank all of our sponsors making this really possible. So um, this is what we're doing today. Uh, it's not a it's not a huge uh, group that have uh, shown up, but it's kind of indicative of, of people who actually care about this series. And that's who, of course, we wanted to show up. Uh, people will probably have the most experience with these sessions and are, are willing, uh, hopefully, to share what they think about it and what we might be doing next. So these are the three questions we put forth. We kind of changed the, the title of this from, uh, you know, from a, a, a discussion session, which it is, I guess, to a workshop, which it actually is, uh, because we don't have any guest speakers today. So it's just us chickens. And these are the questions we want to take away here. And we'll go through them one by one, uh, rather than try to tackle them all person by person. We'll just go around Robin and have everybody weigh in on each one of these and then see what we get. So we don't, Again, this is not a TV show, so we don't have strict time limits, so we can finish early or we can run over, just however the discussion goes. So uh, to date, we've had, surprisingly, 9,000 registrations for the series, which I thought we were closer to, like, you know, pushing 6,000, but I checked the numbers, and that's what we got. So, surprise. And over 200 speakers, they've, they've just been great people. Many of you have uh, appeared and presented on, on the sessions and then uh, they're all recorded, thanks to IFLA, uh, and posted on the YouTube channel, Libraries in Response, YouTube, you can look it up, and you'll see all of them there. And the, the surprising thing is that the video views have been rising faster than the registration. So the totals for over four years, we have more registrations, but over the last 18 months, the the video views have roughly doubled the registrations, so that's great. Um, I mean, there, everybody has their all uh, you know different reasons for for looking at these. They missed the session, or they wanted to see it again, or they just heard about it, whatever it is. I mean, there are people subscribing to that channel, and you're all welcome to do that. But uh, it it validates the idea that that we're recording these and that they're of value to people. So we love that. These are the these are the most popular ones, you can just you just sort by, you know, views. And here's the one from uh, year one. I mean, that must have been somewhere around May or May of 2020, this Arizona to Africa. We had the state librarian from Arizona and, and a, uh, a national librarian, I believe, from Ghana who spoke and it didn't seem like it was that popular at the time, but now we've had a thousand people tune into that, you know, three, almost four year old video. So interesting. And then uh, uh, Corey uh, Doctorow is a popular guy uh, and he has attracted uh, a lot of views. And actually we have uh, booked Corey to come back in May to give us an update on this process is this drum he's been banging for a long time on the instantification of the internet and how it used to be better than it seems like it is today and it's a that's a natural evolution of the companies the major platforms and how they capture markets and then leverage those markets to the degradation of the services and to our general mm, lack of benefit i'll put it that way 
otherwise, uh, AI has been our definitely most popular topic, and we're involved in that. You may recall we announced the beginning of uh, the, the state uh, library and AI uh, tools project on February the 1st. And that is part of that. And we have initiated a first Thursday with AI series now. So every first Thursday of every month, we're going to do an AI focus. The next one we're going to have is on April the 4th, next, next, next week. And we have two speakers lined up, uh, uh, a booster, an AI booster from Silicon Valley, uh, Pete, Pete Leiden, uh, on the age of AI begins. And so Pete's all in on this stuff. And it's easier to find people that are that are doubtful or dreading or, you know, in great high anxiety about about this technology with good reason, in our opinion. Uh, but uh, Pete is the flip side of that. Pete thinks, you know, it's really nothing to worry about compared to the the benefits we're all going to derive from it. So we'll be able to hear that story. And then we'll have uh, on with him uh, uh, a fellow that is uh, a consultant. Uh, uh, Nick Kenzie, the digital librarian, really sharp guy. He's been writing about AI and he he's a good speaker and he's going to come on and give us a more narrow focus AI and libraries uh, uh, view of things. So we started with COVID. It's still happening. You know, a lot of people with long, a lot of people with long COVID out there are still suffering and, and it could change at any time. It's changing constantly. We get these new versions. They don't seem to be threatening so we're ignoring it for the most part. But if it's not COVID, it's maybe something else. We're just living in this new environment and uh, it can upset the apple cart overnight, as we saw. Uh, this is this is the big kahuna in our opinion. This is our this is the, the inescapable uh, overarching crisis. It shrinks all the other ones to, I wouldn't say minuscule, but to much smaller uh, degree. If we can't well, it's it's pretty late in the game as the as the fi recent findings show. Major changes are inevitable and reverse irreversible. So where does that leave libraries? Our position on that is, well, everybody needs to do their part. Yes, you know, we need to recycle. We need to save water. All the things that we're trying to do individually are great, and it works in the aggregate, but. It's going to take large actors. I mean, the really the biggest players, the national governments, the the global banking system to embrace this for us to really have a chance. How that's going to happen, no, I don't know. But in the meantime, we all have to deal with what's happening to each of us in each community and each household where we live. And that's adaptation. So we've got mitigation, big players, aggregate of all individual actors, and then there's adaptation, which fits and scales down to everyone, every household, every community. And this is where we think libraries uh, are really the most uh, capable to lead their communities in, in different kinds of adaptation strategies, understanding what's happening, preparing for it, and just being ready to deal with it when it happens. Because it does happen, and people go to the library to, you know, for help. They always have. This is the latest one. Of course, AI is is a to hot topic. A AI, and um, we don't really quite know what it is, other than it's, other than it is uh, uh, pervasive. It's it's hitting. This is not all of AI. AI has been around for years and effectively used. We've, we've been referring to these as algorithms for some time. These that we have experienced or have experienced us are embedded in systems uh, and, uh, and trying to uh, optimize processes like uh, uh, trading, financial trading, or uh, uh, supply chain optimization. This kind of stuff's been going on for a long time. What's new is AI for end users. That is to say, tools that people, individual individuals can get their hands on and do things with. And that's what has really uh, lit up everything. And that itself has commercial enterprise uh, uh, impacts. And that's what everybody's trying to discover. 
Uh, coding seems to be a really powerful application for this stuff. The recent news is, well, maybe this is actually sort of a, you know, a Y2K kind of a thing. Everybody got excited about it, but it's really not that powerful or it's not that uh, impactful. Well, it's we just don't know. We just have to keep watching it, testing it, and trying to develop policies about it. Personal kind of thing. So all of these things add up to uh, this term polycrisis, which, which is not just simply all of these uh, uh, happening more or less simultaneously, but all of them happening simultaneously and interacting and reinforcing each other. This is a really complex kind of uh, concept related to a crisis, and we'll be exploring that as such uh, in the year ahead, among one thing. So let's uh let's get to it here and we'll open the discussion now thank you for indulging me for uh this first 15 plus minutes and, and for review but i just wanted to set things up for the discussion now there we go stop stop share stop Okay. Okay. Let's see. Uh, let's let's do a hand raise for anybody that wants to weigh in on question number one, which I should have there, which I don't have there, which is, what's the most important idea message you've taken away from the series? So did I see Diane? Okay, Diane, please. I'm always happy to talk about libraries. So uh, I come um, from a practitioner's standpoint, um, been a director of a rural library. I love technology in general. So uh, one of my experience is finding out about other libraries doing really interesting work and how difficult it has been for me to learn about those things, unless it happens to be an article in library journal or something. Um, and I've gotten to the point, just the flood of information that comes in now, I'm sometimes regretfully having to delete emails before I can read them. Um, so for me, one of the ideas is that there are great ideas out there and how do we get better at sharing them? And so that may bleed into question number three, but there's an AI uh, newsletter I subscribe to, Superhuman AI. And um, it's such a good newsletter because it's this curated bullet point list of, of ideas. So that was kind of my big thought is how do we find out more about um, what other libraries are doing? And is there a way to make the YouTube videos searchable by keyword? I use Otter AI to record and summarize meetings. And, and you can input a specific word like um, Eric Bokenstein. I was trying to find on a video where he had said a, a specific thing. And if I could have searched and gone right to that word, that would have been, that would have saved me a lot of time. Well, good. Okay. Uh, yes, that's a great idea. We'll we'll explore that. We're going to luckily recording all of this, so I don't have to take notes. Uh, but uh, these are all good, and let's let's do go. We can go. We'll go around again, so we'll come back to you know ideas for the future. You don't have to get it all in the first first one. Uh, I'd like to call on Jen Nelson in New Jersey to weigh in right now. Thank you, Don. I appreciate that. It's good to see everybody here. A lot of familiar faces. Um, I um, kind of coming at it from a little different perspective than Diane, which is part of the reason this is so valuable, um, is I, I'm really taking a 10,000 foot view. And um, the more things change, the more they stay the same is what keeps resonating for me. Um, we're facing some of the same. I've been a librarian for close to 40 years, and we're facing some of the same issues uh, with the new technology that we did with the technology that's now 
in in-house standard. You know, I was in libraries before there was the internet. So that was, you know, a, a disruption or before there was widespread internet, we had ARPANET and, and that. Um, so that's, um, a, you know, kind of what I, what's really been resonating for me. I think Diana is right on target. You know, how do we find and really amplify some of the great work that's happening? Um, and you seem to have a really good knack for that, Don, and I'm not sure I, I don't I don't know where it comes from, but you you do a great job with that of finding things that are really um, interesting uh, and topical and unusual. You know, they're not the usual library fair uh, that you see in Library Journal, or American Libraries, or whatever. So, um, so I'm grateful for that. So that's kind of where I'm coming in from. Thank you. Well, maybe not being a librarian helps, uh, but. <laughs> But of course, I've become completely fascinated with the world of libraries and librarians, especially. Uh, you're all just such amazing people doing really incredible and essential work. Uh, it's and it's so easy to underestimate and overlook. It's just the classic, you know, view of libraries uh, that we and I know the profession struggle against. How to how to make help people understand the value of libraries. So that's what's partly motivating us. We've come at this, you know, from gradually. It's not just pop out of the blue. We worked our way up to this through, you know, decades of, of technology experience. And this, this is where we've landed. And it's, it's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, you, you have a brief response to what's the <laughs> most important idea and message uh, you've taken away from the series. Don knows I can get into a rant, but I, I, my short answer is, uh, it's almost a theme of the uh, events, is the power of collective action. We tend to be a very personally accountable profession, and we uh, take on a lot of stress alone, and the Teams and the speakers and the state libraries and IMLS and IFLA show the power of collective action, especially in sweeping a net that draws in those who have the brights, but not the flexible budgets like small rural libraries where they absolutely need leadership and they need to hang on to those collective action activities. So it fits into our influence and our funding and E-rate and all the things that we need to protect and move to the next plateau. So that's my theme is collective action. Very good. Excellent. And you've you've touched a, a sensitive point uh, and a very important one. And it is a focus we've had uh, on the needs of smaller libraries, rural libraries, under-resourced libraries. It's one of the things that got us here was on the connectivity side of things, that they're, you know, poor connections in these small communities have just been devastating to uh, community health. I don't mean health in the normal way. I mean the economic health of communities because, you know, the kids all leave if there's no good connectivity to support interactions. I mean, the global conversation is happening just like we're doing it right now. And if you don't have a decent connection, you're just not participating. And so the kids leave and no companies are going to move in. So the towns are just shrinking, drying up, and people are desperate and unhappy unless they have a librarian like Diane around to boost things up and, uh, and keep things rolling. So, yeah. And that's the other part about state libraries is that they – one of their special superpowers is supporting small libraries, under-resourced libraries. You know, the big systems, they have everything that, you know, they need, New York, LA, you know, they're, they're loaded, Toronto. <clears throat> but uh, the, the small libraries need support. And that's a great point, Stephen. Um, let's see, who else? I don't see any hands. I'm happy to call on Stephanie Bailey-White. Yeah, I... This is a, a good format for me. I agree with uh, Diane. It's hard to sift through um, and find those, you know, what what different libraries are doing. I love that it's library focused. I'll tune in anytime or listen to the recording if there's a, another state librarian talking about uh, cool things that they're doing. Uh, I The Starlink stuff was really interesting and got us, you know, kind of uh, 
me particularly more uh, in tune with what's going on there. So I've just really appreciated the opportunity to um, participate and uh, always, always look forward to seeing what's, what's up in the queue. So thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, Ray, you got your hand up. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Don. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Pun. I am an education librarian, so I serve teachers and graduate students. And I think for me, having attended several of these sessions um, made me think about what others are, have been sharing, that the key is a lot of it is partnership, like one, not one library can, can address all these different issues, but also the idea of our role as translating complex, difficult, whether that's technologies or ideas or opportunities it's just something feasible um, and that's what libraries do we're like the incubators and we're testing things out we're innovating but we're also like in a way reacting to some of the stuff that's happening and trying to be more proactive which is is very um challenging but so i see opportunities just great opportunities hearing from what colleagues like in public libraries state libraries and academic libraries are doing so it helps us um learn from each other so we're not siloed in our different library types very cool. Thank you, Ray. Um, you, you mentioned libraries as laboratories. That is such a powerful idea to us. <clears throat> Mainly, libraries, you know, are not constrained like all the other public institutions have very narrow charters. I mean, schools have to be schools and clinics have to be clinics, and they just can't get outside of that. But libraries, you know, mostly are, are locally funded, but they can do anything their committees want them to do. And they do, and and it's just a great place for the community to try things out. <clears throat> Speaking of environmental concerns, a, a library is an ideal place to showcase, is a companion to uh, a lab, uh, emerging technologies. You know, either you know, uh, like uh, energy techniques, uh, insulation, just anything. You've got this the center that you can show. You can turn it inside out, and people can see all these kind of things that. You know, uh, 3D printing, and that's the basic premise of the library is that that allows the community to pool resources, acquire things or value in the community, and then the community shares them. You know, it's not unlimited for everybody, but everybody can, if they're willing to take turns and sharing something they're interested in, the library provides that. That is such a cool idea. It's just astounding. But I love the lab concept. Uh, Sarah, I see you there. You want to you want to uh, respond sure. to this opening question here about what? Uh... Well, I, as, as you know, Don, this is a pretty fun journey for me because um, I've been on both sides of this. I was in Marin County with you um, when this started, and I think I was one of the first people you talked to. Um, I don't know it was inaugural, but it was one of the first few. Um, yep. And then I came over to State Library Land here in Washington. <laughs> so I guess um, for me. Well, I first wanted to say just deep admiration for you because um, the, it's just the tenacity to do this um, and to put this together and to stay with it. And because I think most of us in our networks, um, a number of things popped up when the pandemic first hit for us to connect. There were many times that, you know, there was um, here in Washington, the public library directors all got together a mini state libraries led a weekly session as we were trying to you know, deal with um, quarantining materials and curbside services and everything that was so very different. But I just wanted to say, um, you know, I think this kind of feels like an offshoot of that, of this connectivity and the ideas and our sharing and how, just as was said before, the collective power, but, um, you know, that it's still with us and that the topics are still critical and there are so many people that are interested and we've done it in a synchronous and asynchronous way. That's pretty cool too. So I just wanna make sure that, um, you know, I, I think we often don't give our advocacy heroes as much um, thank you as they as they need. And so I just wanna say that to you. Thank you for um, I, your leadership I, here and you're getting um, sponsors and finding incredibly interesting topics on a continual basis, which is any of us that do this know that is not an easy feat. So, so yeah. that's my my um, uh, contribution. That's a that's a great contribution. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, yeah, we've been associated since you were here in in 
in Marin County and now at the head of the library in, in Washington State, which, by the way, uh, has been the, the strongest participant. That is to say, the staff of the State Library of Washington is the top ranked uh, group that has tuned in for these sessions. I, I had, we collected some numbers on that. I've, I've lost track of them, but that's, I'm sure that's still the case because I kind of see people coming through. We don't dive that deeply into kind of who participates. Of course, we pay some attention to it, uh, mostly from the numbers standpoint, but um, we're just happy that people find it worth their time. Uh, I find it worth my time. And mostly the things we've talked about or things that are interesting to me. I mean, I'm I'm just confessing here. You, you're supposed to be, you know, your your customers and what you want to. You know. Well, I'm just kind of guided by what I find interesting and fascinating, and sort of these emerging uh, technologies have always been of interest to me. I'm an old sci-fi nut from, oh, you know, I'm a space cadet from the '50s, and so this is all becoming real. And I've stopped reading much sci-fi because the current reality is, is feels like fictional and has surpassed some of the stuff that we used to dream about and it's happening today. So that's sort of been a guiding thing. And then how that impacts society and, and, and libraries are the way to look at society. So it's really a gift to me. So I, I don't find this onerous at all. I find it really uh, fun and interesting. And I learn a lot. And so uh, let's see, anyone else want to weigh in on important ideas here? Like uh, any of these topics, I kind of ran through them, but uh, we've got, well, we'll get to these with what we're going to explore. So that's great. So is there anything that's really been surprising? Some of you kind of already addressed that in your opening uh, responses. Uh, I'm presuming that everybody here, this is this is kind of a, you know, because we called it a workshop, because we described it as a workshop, there are very few of us today by comparison, but uh, thank you. But I'm presuming that you all showed up because you actually have some ideas about this. And so, uh, Dave, you're a frequent, if you're actually there, you're a frequent visitor. Uh, do you want to add anything? Will, you too. Just unmute and say something if you're actually there. Or uh, here comes Will. Hey, Will. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm just eavesdropping. <laughs> Can we put you on the spot? Did anything surprise you uh, in the... Because you you've been doing for you've been coming for a couple of years anyway, right? Uh, yeah, probably a year or so. Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, I keep coming back because, <laughs> because they're sort of continually interesting and surprising. I don't know that there's a particular topic that's standing out to me. Um, uh, but, uh, Listen, but yeah, you're surprised it, that they're surprising. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'd echo sort of the others' gratitude for your continually putting together uh, interesting topics. Um, but I don't know that I have anything edifying to say about it. All right. No, that's great. Sorry. I, did, I don't mean to. Uh, Stephen? I think uh, one of my surprises is the extent to which broadband connects. So you might have started off with pandemic and uh, uh, bandwidth issues, which were the just pain points. But now we're looking at that broadband affects everything. It affects people's ability to learn. It affects their economic opportunity. It affects DEIA. You know, I think you've been somewhat responsible for adding the A to DEI. <laughs> so, you know, getting access into it. And this is, there's almost, you mentioned climate change every time. And we're seeing the broadband and the satellites tell us what's happening in the world that we didn't know before, and it's more open. So I think my surprise is this topic actually drives everything. So if we look at a new disruptor like AI, 
our experience in working through the pandemic and reopening is very similar on many fronts with the AI challenge to librarians, libraries, information workers. Indeed. So that surprised you? Yeah, a bit. O only because I think it it's taken us a long time to really own the impact of libraries on the scale that they're doing. My social return on investment models show a 2,700% return on investment for every dollar invested in a library. And so you try and find me a stock market that's running at 2,700%. And you try and find me some of our traditional measures. But we need to own the power we deliver to communities. And it's one of the reasons we're seeing uh, people pushing back against us because we empower people and level the playing field, which there are some evil people out there who don't want the playing field leveled. They want low wage workers. They want people who can't think, who don't have the information they need to think through critical decisions like voting or job changes or change in society. So we have a power that we need to acknowledge and own. And I think talking it through over these last four or five years, I see people uh, migrating, evolving, doing a good job on, on a good, solid social value system that we collectively enhance and, and own amongst ourselves. 2,700%, Stephen? Yep, that's the average. That's the average in Ontario. We get a uh, 650% return on investment for every dollar invested. But we, for economic, uh, on our economic models, we repeated that study 150 times. But now we're up to 100 of the social return on investment model that we had developed independently at uh, three universities with the Nordic Institute. And that model is proving that our social return on investment on a very conservative model is 2,700%. Why can't we get the economists to write that up? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, seriously. Because, because it's a capitalist tool and the capitalists don't want the social sector. Sorry, you're getting my politics. But there are reasons why our voices are diminished in this space. And it's because we offend the 95% of the newspapers are owned by Republican families in the U.S. And there's only six of them that own the papers from the uh, the two big think tanks in newspaper land. And that limits the voice of people who talk to empowerment issues through education, thinking sharing, and free access. And I, by free, I mean unfettered. We are right. wrong to call ourselves cost-free. We we think we make a difference because we're unfettered. And that's the right. Unfettered access and stigma-free access is our magic sauce. Well, newspapers, yes, we've seen a lot of changes in newspapers. I mean, if there's an impact that the internet has had in the last 30 years, that's one of the places to start newspapers used to be financed uh with want ads well you know uh um, what's his name you know replace that overnight well, we have ebay and we have uh, uh craigslist i mean it just just all these different historical i think historical like you know 50 years before that activities or institutions were disrupted like within five years, they were all kind of completely undercut the music industry, you just one thing after another. It was actually pretty sudden. And that's one of the things that, that has kind of struck me about the, the arrival of AI. It may be more significant, but it's not as obvious what the changes are that uh, it's causing. Maybe I just lack enough time perspective to to, to see what's happening, and it may be more significant. It probably is more significant. It's just more subtle somehow. It, it's just, it's becoming the, the internet itself. 
So it's sort of like the fish describing water. It's just, it'll be everywhere and incorporated into everything. And it'll just be some way we interact. But And there's, and there's an announcement every day. So yeah, Diane mentioned sure. super, superhuman AI, and it's an excellent oh, newsletter. No. So I decided to put in the chat all the AI newsletters that I read on a daily basis, and they're they're very good. But one of them today, they launched the first emotionally intelligent AI. Now, how yeah. performative it is, but it apparently senses your emotions, which is uh, one of part of my definition of emotional intelligence. So it's, you know, when you start to we have difficulty telling performative emotional intelligence apart from real emotional intelligence, which our profession has in spades. That's yeah. a challenge for us. That is a challenge. And, you know, these are, <clears throat> these are things that can be quantified through enough research, you know, little sound waves detected this and that and indicate, you know, this emotional state and all these kind of things are being, uh, digitized, you know, analyzed, codified, digitized, and then embedded into applications, which in turn are being uh, pointed at us. And uh, it's it's a huge deal. Uh, clearly, AI is one of our ongoing topics because it's a it's a real time discovery process. You just illustrated that, and we're all aware of the flood of information that are coming at us. I mean, we need AI to sort AI uh, from you know, how we can prioritize the things that are that are relevant and important. It's a big challenge. It's a, it's a kind of a curation challenge that, that we're looking at as part of the Slate project, which we'll be talking about again. This is the State Library AI uh, Tools uh, Program project. <laughs> um, okay, okay, let's, let's move on here to uh, question three. That's a, a list of the... Uh, the topics that have, I put in the chat, I'm sorry, a list of topics that we have covered, uh, we are covering, and are looking to sort of prioritize, I guess, because they're all interesting. Uh, they're all worth an hour easily, each of them. Um, and we really haven't done surveys. This session right now is the closest thing we've done to uh, gathering feedback, uh, which I don't know, maybe we're lazy about that, but it just seems like, you know, except for AI stories, surveys are the most, the biggest onslaught that we have to deal with and we're reluctant to do that, but maybe we actually should. Does anybody have a, an idea about how best to prioritize uh, uh, those topics or others? Of course, others are always other. Uh, Don, and, Don and I, think it's, I think it's the other. We might want to do a brainstorm in the chat to yeah. uh, to to get a longer list it's a diverge converge exercise uh -huh. but you got a whole year you got 52 sessions potentially uh we can cover it all it's a matter of well there's summers off and stuff like that but um Thank there's you. room for some pretty cool things and finding finding stuff yeah so i'll start and put something in the well, we we kind of feel our way along. If a lot of people show up for a topic, we go, well, that must be of interesting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then also uh, the views, the later views. We had a, a session that uh, Stephen Weiber put together on library diplomacy, uh, a very new idea, which really we find fascinating. Sort of the notion that there's a, a layer of international well, it doesn't have to be international, but you know, remote library to re library uh, interactions, uh, exchanges, uh, cultural, professional, and so forth, that can support uh, awareness uh, across cultures, which we seem to, in spite of our communication, we seem to be losing empathy. Uh, somehow, we should be knowing much more and understanding much more about each other, but it seems like it's going in the opposite direction. Uh, but Stephen, anyway, put that together. Uh, the fellow that has really worked on this uh, was in is in Australia at, at the time, and that's where they conducted it. So we had uh, Stephen 
it, it, it happened at, at 2 a.m. I don't know if anybody saw their invitation. <laughs> uh, 2 a.m. in or 1 a.m. in California. Uh, so not very many people showed up, uh, you know, understandably. But it's been very popular as a YouTube video. So we haven't, you know, we've we haven't done enough international uh, work. We feel uh, because there are a lot of interesting stories beyond the U.S. and including beyond the U.S. and Canada uh, that we think are worth uh, exploring. And, that, and to the degree that these activities can help create a well a network or, or knit together some of these institutions that are, I mean, we're all working on global issues. And most of these topics that are listed, not all, of course, but most of these are global issues. The climate is global. The pandemic was global. AI is global. So it matters what is happening everywhere, uh, increasingly so. And maybe we can help <clears throat> do that. Uh, thanks for adding things into the chat. That's a really valuable place to uh, drop in ideas and notions. Uh, let's pick up uh, question number three here, which is kind of what we're talking about already. Uh, professional development, Ray, I like that. Uh, how do we think about conferences, personal versus online? This is Ray's uh, comment in the chat. Is in-person need anymore? Yeah, it is actually, Ray. Do these sessions help? Maybe. Our field is always about sharing professional development and learn best practices, right? Uh, not that many people can go to conferences domestically. Well, you're right. I mean, here we are. We're scattered all over the place and we're using the very technology as an alternative uh but people need people uh as johnny cash put it flesh and blood needs flesh and blood and the uh, the difference in the level of communication between uh what we're doing right now and being in the same room is really impressive uh there's just so much so much comes through when you're when you're live with a person compared to a screen. It's efficient. You know, email is my best comparison to this. Email is super effective communication uh, medium, but it's flat. You know, you have to put a little smiley on there to make sure that your irony gets through, right? Because it's just it bleeds out all the subtleties out of communication. And so this is the trade off that we've been making with technology: is convenience for depth. You know, we become wide and shallow and increasingly less deep because of the technology. So, Ray, we need them both, uh, at least in my opinion. But I'm really happy that that we have this kind of a tool to to do what we're doing today. Um, Jen, you had your hand up, didn't you? I, I did, Don. And um, I was actually going to answer the, the question you had about... Uh, um, prioritizing, and I was going to take a, a a very pragmatic approach, which is uh -oh. who's available. You know, who who are you able to to actually contact with to come and do it, knowing that there is such a very uh, an interest in everything. I think I would go so far as to say you can rely on the fact that people are going to be interested in whatever is being picked. Um, so it's really just a matter of who's available and, you know, making sure that you get the speaker that feels like the best fit for, uh, for the topic. Great. Great. Well, it helps that we've been doing this for four years. It helps that nearly 10,000 people have registered for the series. So when you kind of lead an invitation with that, it's more attractive to a lot of people to come before this group and, uh, the surprise of the whole thing related to speakers, I'm glad you reminded me of that, is that we normally think about, you know, inviting people in, experts in different fields to share their experience with them. We listen to them, we learn, and, you know, for their insights and their, their presentations. What I've discovered, which is obvious when you think about it, like everything I've ever discovered is always obvious, uh, but that when you when you speak to a group, if you're a decent speaker, you think about the group, right? Who am I talking to? What what do they care about? And 
And the value here that we had not anticipated is the people who come on and speak to librarians and the library world are themselves exposed to the library world by virtue of the fact they're thinking about it. And it's, so it's a chance actually to influence the influencers, if I can put it that way. They go away from these having a little bit different feeling for libraries. I mean, we make the case and they get it. A lot of the times they get it. So it's it's having that kind of a, I would call it a blowback, but it's a positive thing. So positive blowback, is that a word or is that a term? Anyway, it's a, it's a kind of a happy side effect from these. And uh, But thank you. Yeah, that's it's been interesting to recruit people. Uh, you know, I... I I cast things out into the other and, you know, a lot of them, I never hear anything, but amazingly, you know, you can, uh, you can find people that's been great gratifying. You find people who actually get libraries and, and they haven't had a way to say that. And this is a way to say that they appreciate libraries like, uh, Bill McKibben, you know, the, the climate activist, this guy is so in demand, you know, he, he doesn't have a minute to breathe. Uh, but he he definitely gets libraries. He thinks they're really important. He came on, he said so. And so that was that was great. Uh, Lori Doctorow, uh, he's an author, so most authors do appreciate libraries, but he's also a really busy guy. He's got a new book out. He's on book tour. He's just bouncing all over the place every single day. He's at some new place, you know, doing book signings, but, you know, he gets libraries, so which is which is great. He's a pretty controversial fellow because he's pretty antagonistic to the to big tech, well, you know, with with good reason. I would I would uh, I would back him on that somewhat. Um, but uh, it's it, it it has been gratifying, and I, I think it's I think it's definitely worthwhile, even to even to invite people. They get some kind of a a notion. There's something happening that they maybe should pay attention to. That's the other part about the emails that I wanted to ask everybody. We normally announce these sessions on the Monday of the same week. I mean, we could do them earlier than that, but it starts to get confusing. You know, which one is actually coming up? The one next week or this week? You know? So we just start on Monday and then we send out reminders on Tuesday, Wednesday, the day before and the hour before. Uh, we always get a number of people that unsubscribe. We've got a list of a couple of thousand active people. We gain some and lose some depending on the topics and depending on, you know, their interest level. Uh, but I'm, I'm sensitive to spam. I hate it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if it's something I'm interested in, I'm glad I got it. I've got a reminder. So I just wondered if anybody had any ideas about how to sort of encourage people, let them know it's happening to, because we can kind of track the responses, you know, they're usually higher the first day on Monday we release it, and then they kind of go down increasingly, but we still get people, you know, in the last hour will uh, register. So does it feel like too much? Does anybody have a feeling about sending out that much email? I mean, you're all here, so I guess you all kind of appreciate it, but... So Don, I do actually. Um, I uh, I think it might be a, a little too frequent. I think you could eliminate the Tuesday. Um, okay. For me, it's nice to have the day before and then the hour before. And now that I, I know that this is a regular occurring occurrence, I just have it blocked on my calendar. So it's really just for me a matter of is the topic. Can I still go and what's the topic? But I think that Tuesday one could go because I always think, didn't I just do that? And, and, well, yeah, I did just do that. Okay. All right. That's great. Uh, I'll, how about the, that's, that's, that's great. I, I think we'll, we'll take that. It, it, it saves me another email from going out. Um, uh, another, uh, Kathleen, thank you for that clever, cute little animated thumb, uh, that you were showing there. Uh, yeah. Oh, you've got your hand now. Okay. Yes. Kathleen. Uh, muted. This is only my second time huh. and I found you because I was at a meeting in Washington DC for the legislative two weeks ago and some people were talking about it and uh, I just happened to get back into my email and I saw that there was, you know, where you were doing the tribute last week 
to uh, the IMLS and I was excited to hear that. So um, what I'm finding is that this group is uh, compassionate, uh, knowledgeable, and they're willing to share. Um, and sometimes you get groups that kind of share, but then they go stop halfway. So I'm really uh, excited about being able to make this time. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, oh, and I'm in South Dakota. I'm the South Dakota. Life I didn't think it was San Diego. Okay, South yeah. Dakota. Great, great. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome. I'm, Thank I'm you. glad you found us. Uh, that was a, a, a great uh uh, interview with Crosby. That was last week. The recording is up. <clears throat> I've asked Stephen Weiber to break those two. There was a presentation, you know, kind of look back five year thing and then 30 minute interview with Crosby. I, I've asked him to just break that up because I think a lot of people will be interested in, in hearing Crosby's story, which is fascinating. <clears throat> Fifth generation banker became a librarian, <laughs> became a, a, a Washington bureaucrat. Uh, but, you know, of course, a great guy. And uh, it was the last hour of his last day on the job that he gave to us for that for that session. Um, but but absolutely welcome. Thank you. And spread the word. I mean, share. We haven't done much marketing. I'll have to say that uh, it's been pretty much word of mouth. Uh, but I've always thought that was the best. It just may not be the most effective uh, way to get the word out. So. Okay, emotional intelligence, library leadership. Okay, public health. Yes, public health. Diane and I have talked about telehealth uh, several times. It seems like it's such a strong suit for libraries to be facilities for people without connectivity, without, I don't know, skills even. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had a next door neighbor. I had to give her tel uh, telehealth support just just to make a connection to her provider. I mean, you know, really simple stuff, but if you don't do this, it's daunting. It's it's hard to imagine being a total newbie on technology if you've been, you know, doing this stuff for but it's real and it's a barrier to participation. And and libraries are just so well suited for it. Uh and the thing that has come up, we've done you know several sessions on telehealth, but kind of to Stephen's point on the ROI of libraries, if there's one that is a bigger return on uh, <laughs> investment for the health industry, industry, then having libraries support patients getting services, information services, diagnostic services, I can't imagine it. But yet, of course, libraries do it for free. I mean, they don't charge and they don't derive any of the savings and benefits from the health industry. So this is a, this is a kind of parallel to the session is that we, we do try to do more than just talk about stuff. We try to do projects. We try to support actual projects <clears throat> uh, that test out ideas because as someone said, everybody that takes a shower gets an idea, but uh, a lot of them just don't survive the road test. And so doing projects with telecommunications, we've done a lot that have, you know, like TV white space are really interesting, but it didn't actually pan out a lot of complications with that wireless technology, but other technologies have been uh, strong. You pointed to the, the satellite technology is a super powerful thing, but what are the implications of that, of having a single company, a single person, controlling a global communications network, uh, sing, you know, which technically can operate autonomously. You know, it doesn't even have to, it doesn't even really need the internet. <clears throat> it can just connect to itself and all the people on it, you know, and that's, that's just un completely unprecedented. All telecommunications is, is a whole mesh of multiple infrastructures that connect all these places and points to point. That's a new thing. And of course, the traditional infrastructure always ends somewhere, just goes as far as the investment can justify and it stops. And there's still people beyond those, those uh, boundaries. This stuff will go basically anywhere. So that's what's that kind of thing fascinates us and, and how, of course, it can connect libraries anywhere and allow libraries to connect. 
I'm running over a little bit here. Um, last words from anybody, because I think we've gathered a lot of helpful stuff that's going to guide us as we build program uh, in the year ahead. It won't be every week. So forget 52 sessions uh, right now. If not, maybe we'll get half that, I I hope. Uh, it feels like I'm on every to... week. Sorry? It feels like I'm on every week. Well, but I, you know, you I, 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 I think an interesting I think an interesting focus is uh to get one of the threads for next year to be the leadership role of library folk in the emerging AI broadband driven environment so that we talk to those leadership issues, our cooperative frameworks, our ALA office uh, various things that we need to get our ducks in a row and be articulate fr from our sector. No one else has the power to speak up for the people than than us. And they're and we're organized. We're intelligent. It, it, if we learned the frameworks to talk about, these are the guardrails that need to be on AI. We don't want it over-regulated, but we want some guardrails on it. If that's a perception that we can start talking to, then we can start talking to uh, some of the rigorous forces that are trying to damage it or turn it into a uh, ridiculous profit-making stuff, like what yeah. happened with satellites, as you used for an example. So yeah. the satellites on Starlink are supporting Gaza and Israel. The, the satellites on Starlink are supporting Ukraine and Russia. So it's bizarro land right now. Anyway, yeah, I'll well, stop. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're, you've hit it. You know, uh, technology for profit and power is the default setting. And so here we are. But you also touch on, a, I think, an important point, And one that we are exploring is that what's the special role of libraries, not just as a voice of the public, which it is, but the field of librarianship that's special in the context of this technology. It feels like that there's a special position that libraries have in understanding it, in translating its importance to the public and to back to the providers of this stuff. Um, I have uh, uh, Gigabit Libraries Network has been awarded uh, press credentials to the uh, Conference on Digital Privacy in uh, Brussels in late May. And so I'm going to be there. It's convenient because, you know, we travel to Europe in the summer. So I'm going to this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to cover it. I've never had press credentials before. I didn't think about us as a, you know, broadcast or a webcast network, but it worked for, for, uh, for they're going to give us space. We're going to do a session from Brussels on data privacy. And the point that I'm going to try to be making there is that the whole thing is about protections, you know, from, from AI is their special theme this year. It's big. It'd be a couple of thousand people, uh, the protections. And, but all of this is about, you know, system controls and regulatory protections, guardrails. That's the conversation that, that it looks like they're talking about. The other side of that in cybersecurity is the behavior of end users because you can have all these, you know, containment things, but if you've got uneducated, clueless, or even sloppy users, they open the door and your security is undermined. So that points to public education, and in this case, AI literacy, which is the drum I'm playing to bang in Brussels in late May. I hope you'll be there, you'll, you'll get notice on it. But uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a worldwide thing. And Europe seems to be, the ones that are willing to take on big tech to some degree, not the U S government, barely the state governments. They're just too big. They're too influential. Uh, some years ago, internet governance forum uh, session, in, it was in Paris and Macron, the president of France came on. He said, there are two versions of the internet. There's the Silicon Valley version and there's the Chinese version. And we in Europe are not particularly attracted to either one of those. And then later, <laughs> the president of the big tele French telecom company, Orange, came on and said, uh, Europe, 
none of the top 10 technology companies in the world are European. They're all Chinese or American. But what Europe is good at is exporting regulations. And this is a moment when I think that's a, that's a superpower and they seem to be taking that up. So we're gonna see how they how they do with that and where we how we can inject libraries into the the conversation of uh, of data protection and privacy, which is a big deal for libraries and everybody else should be anyway. So okay, it's time to close this. Thank you all. The, you're the hardest of the hardcore here in the last minutes, and we appreciate it. Will Dave Saparshi? Uh, are you there, Saparshi? You want to say anything? Well, thanks for coming anyway. And Diane and Stephen, always great to see you. Thanks again for everything. We'll see you again. We'll have you on back and doing your, your specialties, which is pretty much everything as far as I can tell. So, okay. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll stop now. Stop. Thank you. Bye-bye, Don. Great thanks. session. Appreciate it.